Good afternoon, brethren, sisters, Church of the Living God. Hello. Hey, Christian, what's your standard of truth? Hmm. What's your, do you have a perfect standard for truth, Mr. Lifelong Christian? <laughs> Uh, somebody commented that in um, on one of the videos, and I, I responded to that. It's like, ah, uh, Mr. Lifelong Christian, what's your standard for truth? And what do these Christians usually say? Well, the Bible. The definitive article, Bible. Hmm? Which one? Well, the Bible. Yeah, I heard you the first time. Uh, which one? Which one's perfect? And see, because of Catholicism, that, that horror, Christianity has been taught that there is no perfect standard. The closest thing they can get is to a translation that somewhat they might are told might be close to what God actually said. But see, they need to have a guy who is trained by the Jesuits to tell them that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just so laughable. And then, and then these brainwashed Christians make statements, well, the oldest and best. Oh, here we go again. The oldest and best. Uh, like Sinaiticus and Vaticanus that are in the custody of Rome. Yeah, though, yeah, yeah. You know why they're uh, the oldest that remain? Because they were never used. Because they're trash. Just because they're the oldest doesn't mean they're the best. Okay? And the originals. The originals penned by uh, the, you know, by Amos and whatnot. Uh, or the originals penned by David. Those don't exist. And even your Jesuit-trained cemeterian scholar would tell you that, that the originals don't exist. The closest that we have is Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, the stuff that's in Rome. Oh, it, it, it's, it's laughable. It, it's totally laughable to see this joke of what Christianity is. And, you know, have, have, brethren, have you went to one of these Christian channels and just looked at the comment section there? Have you looked? <laughs> In Amos chapter 8, we're going to be going over some things that we've already done before. But, you know, brethren, we have to continue to strive to be the pillar and ground of truth onto this world and onto these Christians who are so, are so warped, so deluded, they don't even carry their Bibles. Their Bibles! Okay, not, not talking about the scriptures, but they don't even take their Bibles to their church buildings anymore. In Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, uh, well-known verses to the saints. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but hearing, but of hearing of the words of the Lord. And of course, uh, hold your place before we read uh, verse 12. Go to Romans chapter 10. Go to Romans chapter 10. Romans 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the lowercase w, word of God. Well, what is the word of God? 
Is it the NIV? Is it the ESV? Is it the LSD, that thing that MacArthur wrote, which uh, Jesuit James White is parading as the best there is, at least for right now? <laughs> uh, faith cometh by hearing. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. There are a lot of these Christians out there. For example, I've watched a few of this uh, smack-a-jerk guy. Uh, that, that guy is a pathetic idiot. Uh, smack-a-jerk, okay? Yeah, he, he, he's... You talk about milk toast, okay? That, that, that guy wouldn't know doctrine if it came and bit him in the rear end. What, what a waste of breath that guy is. Smack-a-jerk or smack-a-jack. Yeah, what a what a waste. What a pathetic waste. Hey, my Canadian friend. I can't believe you set that guy out on me that one time. What's wrong with you? You you are better at your little charade than that guy is. Shame on you, dude. You shouldn't have done that. You should have, should have dealt with it yourself instead of go to your little stupid brethren. Especially that guy. That, that guy's a waste of time. You're better at your charade than he is, okay? I, I was very disappointed in you in that. But anyway, now back to uh, Amos chapter 8. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, or, or a, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing of the words of the Lord. And hey, you know, which one is the true word of God? Which one is perfect? Hmm? You ask a Christian. You ask a Christian. What's the perfect standard? They are trained to say the Bible. Confront them. Which one? Well, I prefer. Ah, you prefer. Well, this one speaks to me. Ah, so your preference has something to do with it. No. No, preference has nothing to do with it. This, the authorized version, is what God has preserved. It is perfect. It is inerrant. It is given by inspiration. The foundation cannot be destroyed. And our foundation is the Word of God, the authorized version. But see, Christians aren't hearing the Word of God. And if they hear anything, it's, uh, it's from one of the myriad of translations of a Bible. And see, I'm all about distinction, buddy. Distinction. And distinction is being so blurred nowadays that nothing is distinct. Verse 12, they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Now, the fulfillment of this, the fulfillment of this, will happen, happen during the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Because of the mark of the beast there, the body of Christ will not be on the earth. Okay, God is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipotent, excuse me. Um, he's, he's not going anywhere. The ones that are going are we, the body of Christ, the church of God. Okay, so when they were, where it says here, and they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. That doesn't mean that the authorized version is not going to be available during the time of Jacob's trouble. No. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Okay, that's not how that works. What's going to happen is, because of the mark of the beast and the body of Christ is not on the earth, it's going to be more difficult for these people to locate the word of God. Because why? The body of Christ is not on earth. Okay? They'll be able to find it, sure. Absolutely. It's not going to be hidden. But see, 
that witness, that testimony that is the body of Christ is not there. There will be the 144,000 Jews, and there will also be Elijah and Moses who are going to be witnessing unto Jews. You know, there's a lot of debate. <clears throat> there is actually amongst the uh, saints about whether or not Gentiles will even be saved during the time of Jacob's trouble. I think it's a little um, far-fetched to say that there ain't going to be no Gentiles saved during the time of Jacob's trouble. I, I, that, that, that just doesn't lend itself to uh, common sense. The majority thereof that will be saved during the time of Jacob's trouble are those who have the faith of Jesus and keep the commandments of God. Because you got to remember, during the time of Jacob's trouble, it's faith and works, and God is going to be turning his attention primarily, solely, onto the Hebraic Jewish people. So the majority is going to be Hebraic Jewish people. But I don't think that doesn't mean that, they ain't, that there's going to be zero Gentiles saved during the time of Jacob's trouble, I, 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 I find that a difficult pill to swallow. I really do. I really do. But today, today, with the body of Christ on earth, there's a famine in the land. People are not hearing the word of God. They're not. They're barely hearing a Bible, let alone the scriptures. And see, you and I, dear saint, go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 on to verse 16. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Now, Christians will come to this and say, oh, it's a building. No, it's not a building. Uh, if it were, then you have all kinds of contradictions within the New Testament itself. In Acts chapter 7, okay, Stephen, uh, where he says, uh, God dwelleth in temples made without hands. Okay, and Paul reiterates that, I believe, in Acts chapter 7. Okay, this is not talking about a building. Okay, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. You and I, saints, we are of God's house. We are of his building, his body. Okay, it's not an actual building with the phallus houses. No, this is the temple of the Holy Ghost and the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, is that spirit. The Lord is that spirit, okay? We are of his house, okay? All right? Just like someone like a Jew from Judah is of the house of David, okay? We are of the house of the Lord. That's what that means. It's not a reference onto an actual physical building, okay? We are of his house. We are of his bones, of his flesh, that's what it means, okay? We belong to him. We have been bought with a price, okay? Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. We are to be a walking, living example of the scripture. We are to be the pillar and ground of the truth. We are called to be ambassadors for Christ. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's why whenever you go anywhere, you always have the sword on you. You always have the scriptures, the authorized version. I don't care if you're going out to get your, uh, to get your mail, take out the trash. I don't care. Have the scriptures on you. Always. Okay? Always. All right? And unfortunately... A lot of people nowadays, especially these Christians, they don't want to hear. Because according to a lot of Christianity, <laughs> uh, we walk by sight, not by faith. Okay? And we walk by faith, not by sight. 
But see, Christianity has flipped it. That's why it's really interesting when you got these guys who make these detailed videos about the actual works themselves, but not what to base those works off of. Does that make sense to you? Hmm? What is the foundation for the works that you and I as saints are supposed to live to? Hmm? Well, hold your place before we continue here. You go to, of course, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, a new creature, okay, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. All right? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Absolutely. But if you haven't figured it out, most of the Christians that you're going to witness onto, they don't want to hear it because they think they already are. With my personal experience, I reckon that 8 out of 10 of these Christians are lost. I really do. Eight out of ten of them. And they want to affix to themselves a word that is worldly in its make. And then they argue about it. Well, uh, like the one brother is like, well, to be a Christian is to be a follower of Christ. What Christ, brother? You still have not answered that. You are my brother, and you know who you are. If you watch this, you know who, I, you, who you are. Please feel free to uh, leave a comment. I have no one going to block you, okay? Um, you, you're not answering that question. Do you know the answer to that question? Which one? I hope you do. I hope you do. But see, we are to be the ground and the pillar of the truth. The, excuse me, I get that backwards. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached on to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up glory. And see, as the church of the living God, we have some definite commandments that we are to adhere to, such as 2 Timothy chapter 2. And here is the main thing. <laughs> Christians are not rightly dividing the word of truth. They're not. You talk about rightly dividing the word of truth with an average Christian, they're going to look at you as if you're speaking to them something heretical. It, it's, it's full of wonder. It's full of wonder. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15 on to verse 19. Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The whole of Scripture is written for you. It's not all written to you, dear friend. And see, not rightly dividing the word of truth is the launching pad for virtually all heresy that exists today. Okay? For example, Catholicism, okay, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. They preach work salvation without assurance of salvation, okay? And they say that all of Scripture jumbled together is all written to you, and that's not the truth. Salvation changes, dear friend. Now, see, you say that to a Christian, they're going to look at you like you're a heretic. Okay? And, and this is very easy to debunk. That salvation is the same from beginning to end. It isn't. It isn't. 
and these stupid uh, sleazy believists like Smack Jack there, um, these guys say to you that it's by grace through faith at the very beginning during the Garden of Eden. And you read Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. It's, it's, it's not by grace through faith in the Garden of Eden. It's not. It's works. They saw God, okay? It's not by grace through faith in the Garden of Eden, okay? But see, that's a symptom of not rightly dividing the word of truth, okay? Salvation changes within the dispensation, okay? I believe and teach and preach there are seven dispensations, okay? I do. And within those dispensations, salvation differs from the previous, okay? We've got several videos on the channel here where we discuss this. Because you're a Christian, you're going to hear me say that, and you're like, that's heresy. <laughs> the, the, uh, the standard teaching of the church has always been, really? I've run into that one re uh, recently. Well, the church has always taught that the body of Christ is going through the Great Tribulation. Which church? The church of the living God, which is the pillar and ground of the truth? Or what do they really mean by that? They're talking about Catholicism. Which from, the, from their inception, from the inception of the Roman Catholic Church, and you can look this up on your own, I tell you to do it all the time, their number one doctrine that they started teaching was one God in three persons. The Trinity, which is absolute satanic, Wicked nonsense. It doesn't exist. No, it does exist. The Trinity will be on the earth during the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Okay? The Trinity is satanic. Okay? <coughs> One God <coughs> in three persons, that's no. But that was one of uh, Rome's number one doctrine that they started preaching at their inception. So when you hear these Christians say, well, the standard position of the church has always been on the Trinity, you're talking about Rome. You're talking about Rome. The standard position of the church has always been that the body of Christ is going through the great tribulation. You're, again, you're talking about Rome. Because Rome tells you that the time that uh, what they call the great tribulation is for the purification of the church. And that's not what it is. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? I'll give any of you a $1,000 of money I don't have if you can find for me in the authorized version of the scriptures, verbatim, the great tribulation. I'll give you a $1,000 of money I don't have. Okay? Show me in the scriptures the great tribulation verbatim the great tribulation show it to me i'll give you a thousand bucks that i don't have okay show it to me see rome has always adhered to that christians are going through the great tribulation okay rome has always done that okay so when you hear Christians make that statement, well, the church is always, uh, wait a minute, time out. What church are you talking about? And without fail, every single time, they describe Catholicism. You know, a lot of people have argued with me that, well, you know, like the one brother who, you know, being a Christian is following Christ. Well, you're not defining which one, okay? And when a lot of the Christians that you encounter, when they go to describe which one they're talking about, they're always talking about the one that's in Rome. But 
But see, again, not rightly dividing the word of truth is the foundation basically for most of the heresies that are there today. Look at the Charismatics. Look at the Catholics. Look at the Calvinists. Look at these stupid sleazy believists. Okay? Look at them. They're not rightly dividing the word of truth. If you, Christian, could at least begin to do that, things would be better for you. I can promise you. I can promise you. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, being more like the world, not being separate, other. And look at what Christianity is doing today. Okay? It's vain, it's profane and vain babblings. Telling people that God, present tense, loves the Christ-rejecting sinner? That's a lie. God does not love you, present tense. If you reject them, we're going to look at this, okay? And their word will eat as doth the canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. you got to like that tie-in. Because we saints who come to the Lord on his terms, not booting the door out of the way, but when we come to the Lord on his terms, he saves us. We are sealed, once saved, always saved, until the day of redemption. Okay? Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But what does Christianity say? Huh? They call evil good and good evil. Not all of them do that, but the majority of what is Christian does. You're being too extreme. we got to be like the world to win the world. A little doesn't hurt. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 12 on to verse 17. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, living godly. How do you live godly? Oh, read the authorized version of the scriptures and find out. Pauline epistles, which is doctrine specific for us today in this dispensation, but also don't neglect the Old Testament for instruction in righteousness, okay? But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I actually believe that there are some of these devils out there who actually believe that they're doing a right by God. I, I really do believe that. They are so deceived in themselves that they actually think that they're serving God a right, rightly divided scripturally today. It's, it's, it's full of wonder. It's full of wonder. A, a, a couple of these sleazy believists that I have encountered, I really believe that some of them think that they're doing the right thing, that they're actually doctrinally correct with jumbling everything together. Though, those are the more dangerous because the false, the hirelings, they, they don't care. You know, they're just there to do, uh, drop dirty bombs and go away. But when you got someone who actually believes what they're shoveling and they're shoveling manure, mm. and yes, you heard me right, sleazy believist, your doctrine, your Christ, and your gospel is manure. Take offense and gay boy, I hope you do. I hope you do. I personally enjoy irritating you sleazy believists. Okay, because you're preaching to these people another gospel and another Jesus. And if I could, and if I were that way, I'd love to smack a jack once, but I'm not like that. <laughs> okay, let's continue. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, 
knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And who, who teaches you? Yes, we learn from man, but the man who is called to preach and teach ought to have the Lord within them and the Lord through the scripture speaks. Okay? See, you're hearing my voice, but when reading the scripture, that's the word of the Lord. And that's prophesying today. That's how it's done. It's not like it was in the Old Testament. Okay? <clears throat> and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All good works. Walking our lives in accordance with the scripture. Okay? Spending time with the Lord in the scripture every day. A lot of the brethren that I converse with, they, they know better when talking with me about giving excuses why they don't read the scripture. Just as some of my brethren get on me about things, that's the one thing that I'm going to get on the brethren about, especially if you're going to talk to me personally and you're going to give me an excuse why you ain't reading the scripture. That's the wrong thing to say to your brother. <laughs> I'll bite your head off if I got it. Okay? All right? But see, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Okay? All right? And that's in Isaiah chapter 28. But we are to be in the scriptures daily, at least a little something. Okay? Why? Why? So that we can, you know, to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, that we be workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. See, when you try to take all of Scripture and blend it together as it all being doctrinally salvific today, all of it, that you're, you're a workman that you're a workman that God's ashamed of. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth, my friend. Okay? And telling people that they've got to keep the Ten Commandments today. No. That, no, you're not rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? No. No, saying that it was by grace through faith in the Garden of Eden, under the law, under the patriarchal period, okay? And the patriarchal period, similar to today, but different in several major areas. The death, burial, and oil resurrection hadn't yet to happen, and there was no eternal security. Eternal security appears in two dispensations. This one, to where the saint who goes to the Lord according to his dictate, not their own, and he saves you, he seals you. When saved, always saved. And also during the time of Jacob's trouble for the 144,000 Jews. Okay? Though that's the only two times that eternal security is in Scripture. You could say, well, what about eternity? Well, of course. But eternity, there's no sin. Okay? There's no sin. And another video we're going to be doing this week, just a, a brush-up kind of course on um, how the dispensations begin and end. We're, that uh, brother asked that, okay? But see, there again, we are to be the pillar and ground of the truth. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And we walk by faith, not by sight. And we are supposed to align ourselves, our lives to the scriptures, Okay? And Christianity doesn't do that. Not at all. You're all about your feelings. You're all about your feelings. And then when you come to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Now, I've heard many Christians with this ridiculous apologetics thing. You've heard about that. I hate that term. It's like I got nothing to apologize for unless I make a mistake. <laughs> and then I got something to apologize for. But 
Christianity, and, and here's the funny part. Christianity will tell people that they have to give an answer to every man that asks them something. Taking what we're about to look at out of context. And then when they come to that, it's like, okay, so i got to answer everybody, uh, every question they ever ask me. No, you don't. What happens is the Christian will run into like a well-versed Muslim who will dissect and tear them to shreds because they're trying to answer every single solitary question. That's not what we're supposed to do. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 on to verse 16. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. A reason of the hope that is in me, that is in you. And Jesus Christ is what? 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. And when you go to Galatians chapter 2, okay? Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. He, he is the seal. Jesus Christ, he is, he is the circumcision made without hands. Okay, Jesus Christ is the Holy Ghost. Okay, the Lord is that spirit. Christ lives within you. Okay, if you're saved, if you've come to the Lord on his terms. Okay. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Come by the law, by something you've done. Okay? But back in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 it says that we are to be ready, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Reason of the hope that's in you. You don't have to answer every question. Okay? Especially with some of these atheists who ask you open-ended questions that they don't want to know the answer to. They're just asking to cause strife and debate. And also a lot of Christians will do that as well. You don't have to answer every question. Don't forget that. But when it comes to the reason of the hope that is in, why do you believe this way? Why do you think this way? What, why, why are you so confident in the face of adversity? Now that's different. That's different. That is... We are to answer. But you don't have to answer every question, brother. Don't, don't, don't pull your hair out of your head trying to answer every question. First of all, uh, pray to the Lord and, and inquire whether or not that individual is asking that question sincerely to hear the truth. Okay? Because especially with the atheists, they'll ask you questions just to try to trip you up, and then you answer, and then they come up with another, and another, and another, and it never ends. Verse 16, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. That's why I want, that's why I want nothing to do with Christianity. Uh, I get uh, I get quite livid with some people when it's like, well, you're a Christian. No, I'm not. I'm a saint of the church of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. I'm not a Christian. 
Okay? I'm not. All right? <laughs> I'm not. But we are to always give an answer for the reason of the hope that is in us, brethren. And Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Read this today. Verses 2 on verse 6. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. And what is that mystery in Christ? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ dwells. God permanently lives within the saved, born-again believer. <clears throat> that is the mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom, fear of the Lord, toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer Every man. Mm. So, Christianity takes that verse and says, well, tiptoe. Don't tell them the truth. Don't scare them. Now, being gentle means not taking stuff that someone isn't ready to hear yet and jamming it down their throat. Okay? You don't bombard them. You don't overdo it with doctrinal stuff that someone has isn't ready to hear yet. Okay? That's what that's talking about. But, as you go, and we'll go to Titus, okay? Christianity takes that verse and twists it and say, well, don't scare people. Love them into the kingdom. We're not building the kingdom today. Uh, the Catholics are building the kingdom today. Okay? In Jude... Uh, Jude 22 and 23, And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. See, Christianity will come to this about where let your speech be always with grace. Don't offend them. Don't tell the sinner of their sin. You see a guy running for a cliff? Don't be like, hey, stop. You're going to go to hell. You need to turn from this stuff. Okay? You're not saved. You're going to hell. Okay? That's telling someone the truth. That's showing someone love. While Christianity shows nothing but hate. Don't offend them. Don't scare them. Seasoned with salt. Salt. Salt is a preservative. But it also is a cleansing agent. You know, when you get salt into a wound, it burns. But it also cleanses. It preserves and cleanses. And in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verses 49 and 50. For everyone shall be salted with fire. It doesn't say, ah, eh, salted. It says salted with fire. And every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good. It says so right there. Salt is good. A lot of doctors, even the beloved Dr. Berg, um, says too much salt is a bad thing. Huh. <laughs> but salt is good. We are to be salty. Burn and preserve. Okay? Salt is good. But if the salt have lost his saltiness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves. 
and have peace one with another. We as ambassadors for Christ are called to be salty. To let our speech be uh, uh, always with grace. Yes, showing unmerited favor. Telling someone the truth in love. Okay? I love you, therefore I'm going to tell you the truth according to Scripture. Christianity says they love you, but they're not going to tell you the truth. They're going to cater to your feelings. Okay? And in giving people the truth, it has to be a pain before it can become a glory. There's no getting away from that. Okay? There isn't. There isn't anything getting away from that. Some of you might think about what James says about the salt water, right? Go to James chapter 3, verses 8 on to verse 14. The thing to remember about James is that it is a book written for who? Who is the book of James written specifically to? James ver uh, chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings to the twelve tribes. The twelve tribes become or will be there again like in the Old, uh, Old Testament during the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Right now the twelve tribes are there, yes. But they're in the, it's the diaspora. They're dispersed. Okay? During the time of Jacob's trouble. They're going to be collected. Okay? Collective. So, the book of James is specifically written onto the Hebraic Jewish people going through the time of Jacob's trouble. And during the time of Jacob's trouble, it's faith and works. That's what James chapter 2 is all about. And see, a lot of Christians mess that up. Okay? Because today... Paul talks about, can faith save us? Yes. But James says, may ask the question, can faith save him? Uh, during the time of Jacob's trouble, it's faith and works. Okay? That'll be in the description box for you to consider. Okay? Again, rightly dividing the word of truth. When it's faith and works, there's no eternal security. Okay? And like I said, the only eternal security during the time of Jacob's trouble is for the 144,000 Jews. Everyone else is like, <laughs> okay? But, keeping that in mind, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? James 3, 800 verse 14. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God, spirit, soul, and body. Okay? Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Right here. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter, can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Huh. And see, some wicked Christian will come, so see this? So see, we're not supposed to be salty in our speech. First of all, it's in context of blessing and cursing, Second of all, it's during a dispensation where it's faith and works, and there's no eternal security except for the 144,000 Jews. Okay? See, again, dear friend, you have to rightly divide the word of truth. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him shew out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, 
Glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Okay? Now, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Verses 1 on to verse 7. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And, beg your pardon, and what does Christianity make you focus on? Things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, when Christ, who is our life, he is our hope, he is our life, shall appear. Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. When he shall appear, clearly, obviously talking about what? The second coming. See, in Revelation chapter 4, come up hither. That's the redemption of the purchased possession. We get called up. At the second coming, we who get called up and meet the Lord in the air, we come back down with him at his second coming. That's what that's talking about. Mortify, kill, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And all of those are forms of idolatry. All of them are. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. Ah. See, a wrath, uh, a child of wrath, a child of disobedience is a lost person who has rejected the gospel. It is not a saved person who's messed up. No, don't, don't believe that won't lie for one second. No, uh, you can prove that by verse 7. In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them when you yourself was lost. Were lost, excuse me. <clears throat> okay. You hear the true gospel once and you reject it. You're a child of wrath. You're a child of disobedience. See, God doesn't love the Christ-rejecting sinner. Present tense. God loved and gave, past tense, but God's present tense love is not there for you Christ-rejecting sinners. Okay? God doesn't love you. You reject him. God doesn't love you. Okay? And see, to Christianity, that tells people God loves you. No, he doesn't. God's love is to be had the way of the cross. Yes. Yes. But willy-nilly, you re reject you reject the gospel? No, God doesn't love you. Contrary to what Christianity tells you. Okay? Now, notice here in verse 4, where it says, When Christ, who is our life, Christ is our hope, Christ is our life, John 11, verses 25 and 26, John 11, 25 and 26. Jesus said unto her, unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? He is the resurrection. He is the redemption of the purchased possession.
There are Christians out there who believe the scriptural doctrine of the redemption of the purchased possession. Okay? Yeah, Christians will be going through the great tribulation. Yeah, yeah. But see, saints, the body of Christ, will be redeemed before the time of Jacob's trouble. And those of you who get left behind, you watch. That man of sin, the son of perdition, he's going to call you guys Christians. You watch. You watch. Okay? But Jesus Christ, he is our hope. He is our life. He is the resurrection. And also, of course, uh, John 14, 6 on the 9. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. The truth, and there is the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye, ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, uh, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, shewest the Father? He is our hope. He is our life. He is the resurrection. He is the way, the truth, and the Father. A lot of Christians who do believe in the scriptural doctrine of the redemption of the purchased possession seem to do this thing where they disassociate Christ from the actual event of the redemption of the purchased possession. That's, that's an error. Christ is the resurrection. Okay, he is. He is the resurrection. And to try to take him away from that con context is heresy. Watch out for that, okay? And we already covered uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verses 1 and 2. And see, we as saints, our example for us today is to live the example by the example given to us by the Apostle Paul. Go to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Paul was the apostle unto the Gentiles, while Peter was the apostle unto the Jews. Okay? And in Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Conference Address, if you will, everybody came out of that preaching what Paul preached. Okay? That's the significance of of Acts 15. It's in Acts 15 where they conclude that, yeah, we, we're not supposed to keep the law uh, today to be saved or stay saved or be right with God. Nobody could do it. Okay? All right? So when you get these guys saying you got to keep the commandments today to be saved like Mark the Messenger does, he's a lying devil heretic. He's lost. Okay? But Acts chapter 9, Verses 10 under verse 22. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Look at this, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. The apostles in Acts chapter 1, they took it upon themselves and they put before the Lord. It's like, Lord, here are the two that we pick. You pick one of the ones that we picked. 
And the Lord's like, who was the Lord's choice to replace Judas Iscariot? Paul, Saul, who would become Paul, okay? Because you never hear anything of Matthias after Acts chapter 1, do you? Never mind the apocryphal book uh, that's uh, fixed to his name. Never mind that. That's not scripture. But. but the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Now, look at that verse. Before the Gentiles, because Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, and kings, King Agrippa, and the children of Israel. And the children of Israel. This is significant because this is showing us that Paul's ultimate overall example of how to follow Christ today in this dispensation, he was the example to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Greek is a Gentile. Peter was the apostle on to the circumcision. Yes, but even Peter, and you read in uh, Second Peter, even Peter himself attributed that Paul's example was the one to be sought after. Okay? That's why Paul and Peter in their writings coincide quite greatly. Okay? But, verse 16, For I will shew him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went, in, went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preacheth, preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this, on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. In Acts 20, Acts 20, 17 on to verse 21. Acts 20, verses 17 on to verse 21. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus, and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews, and how I kept nothing, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have shewed you, and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance turning toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the things that the sleazy believers likes to say is that repentance is going from unbelief to belief. No. No, especially in that context. No. 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 Repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ to the Jew and also to the Greek. Romans 1, Romans 1, 14 on to 21. Romans 1, 14 on to 21. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me as so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the good news of Christ. 
For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. The Greek is a Gentile. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. From faith under the law and what God was going to do, to faith today in this dispensation, that it is finished. <clears throat> faith to faith, that's what that's talking about. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shewed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You know, when an atheist says, makes this stupid, like that uh, Gracie guy or Grayson guy, um, who says that he sees no scientific evidence for God. Um, look in the mirror. You have a spirit, you have a soul, you have a body. Okay? The spirit and soul did not evolve. The body did not evolve. Okay? These were created things. Okay? God breathed into his nostrils and man became a living soul. Okay, the best evidence for a creator is you yourself. You have a spirit, you have a soul, you have a body. God has a spirit, the Holy Ghost. He has a soul, God the Father. The Word made flesh is the body. We're made in the image of God. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And their foolish heart, excuse me, was darkened. Let's keep reading. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and the fool says in his heart there is no God. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, first thing mentioned, and to birds and the four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever, amen, serving and worshiping themselves. Like in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 11 on to verse 16. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 11 on to verse 16. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, to wine and flame them. And the harp and the vial, the tabret and pipe and wine are in their feasts. But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Hmm. Look at the modern church services. The Christian church services. With their stand up, sit down, jump around. Mind control. <laughs> and their ridiculous CCM. <clears throat> Therefore... My people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Hmm. And the thirst in a dry land where there no, is no water, no living water. Yeah. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it and the mean man shall be brought down and the mighty man shall be humbled 
and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. It's, it's funny that Christianity is increasing in knowledge, but yet they know nothing of the Lord that they purport to serve. And when you come to them with the doctrine of the Godhead, the redemption of the purchased possession, rightly dividing the word of truth, <coughs> <coughs> these truths that are self-evident are not evident unto the Christian. So. That's going to be it for this little video, as you can tell kind of don't really have that much of a voice. Um, still not out of the woods yet, but um, it's going to be it for this little video. Uh, a video coming this week is we're going to go through, and uh, a brother had asked a question about, well, do all dispensations end and begin with a big event? Uh, we're going to be looking at that sometime this week. So, so you know, that's going to be um it's going to be there this week sometime because these are these are you know i'm discovering brethren we need to we need to be with these christians giving them milk because they're not able to bear the meat and in giving them milk the basics they don't even get the basics, okay? <laughs> they, they don't. They, they don't even get the basics. One second. Hebrews 5, verses 12 on to verse 14. You know, like that guy, Mr. Lifelong Christian. You see me, buddy? What's your standard for truth? And I'll bet you that guy will give every Roman Catholic Jesuit answer that he's fed by their cemeterian people. I bet you. But for when the time, uh, Hebrews 5, 12 on to verse 14. Christians who have been saved for 25 years, yet when you mention rightly dividing the word of truth, they look at you like you're a heretic. You talk to them about the redemption of the purchased possession. Uh, the church has always taught, ah, uh, which one you talking about? Th this, brethren, this is what we're dealing with in these last days. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. <clears throat> for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And what does Christianity do today? It tells you uh, that evil is good and good is evil. And of course, follow this up with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and then we'll be done. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1, all on to verse 9. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. Why? For ye are yet carnal, fleshly. Virtually every denomination in Christianity, even King James Bible believing Christianity, is so carnal, is so fleshly, 
It's disgusting. Every single denomination is carnal. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Mere men. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Hmm. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor, according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. So, thank you very much, brethren. Hope this, uh, hope this is a little encouragement for you as the Church of the Living God to continue to be vigilant and diligent staying in the word and remember brethren that a lot of these people that we are have to witness to and have to deal with they don't even know the nuts and bolts so be ready always to give a reason for the hope that is in you so that's going to be it for this video thank you for watching this if you do love you and i'll see you in the next video bye bye